So my name is Kaito Streets. I'm on the national Japanese fencing team. I also was on the 2021 Tokyo Olympic team. And yeah, I grew up in the US, but I represent Japan now. So I was, a lot of people don't know that I was actually born in Japan and I moved to the States when I was about seven years old. And I picked up fencing when I was eight. So like a year after I moved to the US and you know, Everyone has their reasoning why they started fencing. Mine was more so, you know, I played a bunch of different sports and my family saw that, you know, since I also like to play with swords, like toy swords, they figured maybe I should do that as more of a profession, kind of like use it, make it useful. And so fencing was like a, a great sport to utilize my enjoyment of playing with swords. So, you know, quickly I enjoy, I fell in love with it and I also got really good at it at a young age and so you know when you start winning and you also enjoy it it's just like a great combination right and so yeah um my mindset was just fencing in the u.s you know i started at a local tournaments and then it became national competitions in the u.s and eventually representing u.s internationally for cadets and juniors and i Represented U.S. for the 2020, no, 2013, 2013 Junior World Championships. Uh, I represented U.S. And I actually switched to Japan 2015. Reasoning f for that was um, I was in college, not really sure how my future career is going to go in terms of fencing. A lot of people in the U.S. retire after college and I thought maybe I was kind of going towards that direction and I knew 2020 Olympics would be in Tokyo and I always had a little bit back in my head like it would be kind of cool to fence for Japan and I've done Japanese competitions there and there and during cadets and juniors and so I was kind of familiar with the team where they kind of knew who I was, that I existed almost. And also my mom being Japanese and she kind of had a dream of me fencing for Japan and also maybe going to Olympics. So I figured, you know, if I was going to continue fencing after college, it would be for Japan. And so when I was a junior in college, that's when I made a switch to represent Japan. So I actually technically tried to go for Rio Olympics, but I was the first alternate. And so, but my main focus was Tokyo Olympics. And what was your experience like then? For Rio? For Tokyo. For Tokyo? I mean, as any Olympics is, it's very stressful. Um, especially the last, you would say, year, year and a half prior to uh, going to the Olympics, the whole qualification was very stressful. Um, you know, every tournament counts a lot. Um, you, can't, you, can, you can't really have a slip up. And so it was a lot of learning and it was a great experience, but it was definitely stressful. And especially with, the, how, how was it with the, the pandemic? With there was limited spectators, how did that affect things? So yeah, I mean, that was very bizarre. You know, you have an image thinking Olympics, the biggest sporting event, especially for fencing, you know, Olympics, the highest pinnacle. And you have that image of like big crowd, loud noises, a lot of lights, and you get there and it's crickets, right? It's silent, dark. Um, but also like, you know, fencing tournaments are not a lot, no. Some competitions have a lot of crowds, but most of them, you know, just the athletes. So it wasn't nothing like new for me. Fencing, fencing. Yeah, it's almost like a yeah, yeah, it's like a typical fencing competition. But yeah, it was kind of bizarre. But you know, once you get on the piste, you're kind of in the zone, right? You're only focusing on your opponent, maybe the referee. That's about it. So at first it was a little bit bizarre, but eventually once you start competing, you forget about it. The Japanese saber is feels like it's really taking off right now. We've seen you know, long history of good foil, epe, but in the recent years, we've seen Sabre taking off. Why do you think that's happening now? That's a great question. When I first joined in 2015, you know, I don't want to say we're nobodies, but, you know, 
we had a couple of good guys, but as a team, we were nowhere near the top. Um, we were losing the top 32s in the team event, barely getting top 16. We were not very competitive. Um, maybe, you know, it could have been the coaching, it could have been the structure. I don't, I'm not really sure. Um, but it definitely changed after the Tokyo Olympics. Um, the team got younger. Um, and this young, these younger kids have been fencing since they're earlier. Um, they might not have experience, but they have like that young athletic bodies and mindset of being hungry. So maybe that's the reason why we're becoming a lot better. And so, yeah, it's kind of interesting to see ever since I joined, we've changed a lot. You know, during the Tokyo Olympics, I was the youngest one on the team. And if you're talking about the whole national team, I was the younger side. And now I'm the, literally the third oldest, second oldest guy. So it's a, quite a different switch. And my role on the team is a little bit different. You know, I'm more of like a veteran on the team, which I don't mind. You know, I have to help these young guys. And, you know, if they do well, especially in a team event, that means, you know, I do well too. So, yeah, I mean, it's a very exciting time for Sabre, both men and women. You know, fen Japanese fencing has always been, ha like, the image has always been foil, you know, with Yuki Ota and all that. But I think, I believe, you know, strongly that Sabre could be the top for Japan. So I'm mostly based in Tokyo, and we train with the whole national team pretty much um, five to six times a week, um, Monday through usually Monday through Friday, sometimes Saturday, but my training usually consists of twice a day. So, you know, and the menu kind of changes in terms of the scheduling of the competition, but regularly Monday is, Monday morning is weight training, Monday afternoon is fencing training, Tuesday will be morning, afternoon, both fencing training, Wednesday will be just morning, after, uh, morning weight training, afternoon off, Thursday will be fencing, fencing. Uh, Friday will be fencing, weight training. And then, you know, once in a while we have morning, Saturday fencing practice. And the volume of training will be adjusted in terms of the competition schedule, travel schedules. But that is like the very, pretty much a summarized rough training schedule for me. So it's pretty much a full-time job. Okay. So, so you're, you're training full-time. How are you funded exactly do you work or is it all sponsors or state funded so the japanese team is funded individually um, based on sponsors or a lot of the the common system for japanese fencers will be they represent like one company so they become like an athlete employee of a company and based on each athlete Maybe they go to work once a week, twice a week, or once a month, or they don't even go to work. They just kind of represent that company. It depends on the athlete and their level. Yeah. Or you can take a different path of gathering a bunch of different sponsorships. Um, or you're in the police academy, like some of the athletes. Um, but it's m pretty much individual base you have to gather your own funding so it's, it's up to you to yeah you can. and the federation when they do have money they might help but a lot of times they, we don't get funding from them you know they go for the coach they give the money to the coaches to go come to the competition sometimes we get money and support from the joc which is the japanese olympic committee it, but it depends yearly you know if they have funding or not so it's best to focus on yourself and try to gather your own funding. So fencing is always changing, especially Sabre. What are the characteristics of Sabre now in 2023 that are perhaps more prevalent than they were in previous years? Hmm. What do you think are the moments which, like, this is 2023 Sabre? So first thing that comes to mind is reprise um, especially since almost like 2022 2023 
maybe a little bit before everything has every action is created through reprise or like second intention in a way um, and yeah it's you have to be creative you know you, you could run off the line but you know it's more you come in you stop and then the action happens and so not necessarily whoever goes fastest after reprise but who can make the right action after a reprise. So it's not off the line. It's almost like off the line and you both kind of stop or, and then the action happens afterwards. So it's almost like there's an added phase. Yeah, add a yeah. step or two steps and then it starts. You're making preparation. Yeah. Start, and then the game yeah. So that's the best way to describe it. Um, and, you know, ever since the t light of the, Timing changed after Rio Olympics. It's heavily um, offensive sport or offensive uh, tactics now. Um, whoever has a you know, attack has a higher chance of getting a point. And do you think um, the attack has got a little, the long attack has got a little bit weaker? Now we see more of people, you know, if someone's bouncing on the spot, now we see more and people are just attacking into that. Is that still still a bit uncertain, or are people getting more and more confident to do that to, to? I think it's a great thing to be creative on defense like that, because if you do not punish people for just jumping up and down or taking a step back, then a long attacks are nearly impossible to defend. So if a moment someone even stops for a second, and the defender comes in, you have to reward them for, you know, getting the priority, the right away, you would call it. Um, and I hope the referees are getting better at calling it, and I hope they are, you know, adjust and start calling more of those uh, um, actions. Because, you know, if you're going forward, you need to be going forward. You can't be going up and down without moving forward or stepping back. You know, it's okay, but if a defender comes at the right time, you have to reward that defender. And yeah, I think it's a great, it kind of makes fencing more enjoyable because it makes it more creative. It's a bit more balanced. Yes, yeah. And what about on the, um, the reprise on the, on the fall short? So if a fencer pulls the other person short, we're seeing more and more of the other fencer after they've fallen short taking over again oh, again yeah i mean that's again that's a great creative tactic right if you know your opponent when they if they make you miss or fall short if they take extra step back you know why not go forward again you know punish them for not having the proper footwork or tactic again but it's, again it's like a timing did you actually go in in time did you not and unfortunately, the referee has to make that decision, but the referee should watch that carefully too. You know. So, you are one of the shorter fencers on the circuit, but you, you still compete just as well against anyone. You've got a pretty strong record against O, who's quite tall. <laughs> <laughs> so what advice would you give to other saber fencers who aren't quite so tall? Yeah, so I get that question a lot. You know, a lot of short fencers, like myself, or shorter fencer, um, ask me all the time, what do I do? And I think, you know, I've looked up, anytime I watch film of other fencers, I only watch shorter fencers. Because I'm not going to watch someone that's 6'5", six, 6'3", six, because I'm never going to mimic their fencing. And what I see a lot with these top shorter fencers is, it all comes down to footwork. You know, you have to be creative in your footwork, you know. You don't necessarily have to be the fastest on your feet, but how can you deceive your opponent with your footwork? And obviously your technical hand technique has to be on point too, but it all starts with your legs. How can you show that you're coming in very deeply without going deep, right? Or how can you show that you're coming in really fast, but you're very much in control of your body? So that's footwork, footwork, footwork. And then also work on your technical blade work. I think since we are shorter, that means we have shorter reach. We kind of have to be very good at parries or, you know, stop cuts. So you have to work on those kind of very precise movements as well. 
But I would say number one would be footwork, and number two would be those blade work. Who are these fences that you've taken the most inspiration from, from watching? So I grew up, you know, few come in mind. Um, one would be like Daryl Homer, who are quite similar in height. He's very explosive, he's very clean. And, you know, I kind of, he's also a U.S. fencer, so I kind of grew up, not just on YouTube, but <clears throat> competing, competing against him in person, watching him, you know, at like American tournaments. And so he's definitely one I used to watch a lot of. Um, another would be a former Russian fencer, Kovalev. Um, he's one of my favorites, his footwork and the things he can do were amazing for his size. And I think he was shorter than me. You know, I've, when I first started fencing in seniors, he was still competing in the senior level. So I got to watch him a little bit live, but majority would be on YouTube. But man, his timing and obviously he had the one of the best parry posts in the game. And so I definitely love watching him. Big ball, big ball. <laughs> and another one would be uh, Romanian Don Luciano. Um, he's also a shorter fencer, but he was just so quick and also very explosive. And so yeah, those threes were definitely the top three I always watched constantly on YouTube. I remember um, in 2014 in Kazan, the final with Kovalev and Gu. I remember watching that live and thinking, I have to be Kovalev. Like this is just that good, everything. Yeah, it's everything. and. He uh, obviously he fence more on the old timing, but I'd never seen a shorter fence to have such a great counter attack. His timing was always on point. And then if you go too early with your hand, he has that quick pair of posts too. So it's like, yeah. And then he had that. I wouldn't know how to describe his style of fence in terms of his long attacks. It was like, like skittery. Skittery, yeah, right. It's like. Quick, slow, quick, slow, but like, it's almost like jittery, right? That was like amazing to watch. And so definitely watch, enjoy watching some fans. And, and now that you're fencing these guys, these top guys, how much video analysis do you do? Do you, is it necessary at this point? Do you know everyone or? So, thing with fencing competition, you never know who you're going to fence, right? It's almost like someone new every time so it's hard to watch every single person but you kind of get a rough idea in terms of everyone's style um, obviously every match is different and you know i've been fencing on the senior circuit for a long time so you fence i fence a lot of quite a lot of people um, and so if i do most most of my film will be any match that i fence to kind of learn what i did wrong what i did well on and then if I know I'm fencing a certain person the next day, that's when I'll kind of watch a few of their matches to kind of understand their habits, their timing, um, their style. But yeah, it's a little bit difficult. It's not like boxing or like MMA where you know your opponent, who you're going to be fighting months in ahead, right? You, you almost don't know. If you make the second day, you only know maybe not even a day, it's almost like several hours. Yeah. So it's a little bit difficult. You know. So, because I know some people, they, they like to go in with a completely open mind without thinking about the opponent. Are you one of the people who, you know, you make it to the second day, you look at the tableau, see who you've got in 64, are you watching that fencer the night before to see, or do you prefer just to take it as it comes? I watch roughly. Mm -hmm. If I watch too much, then I might get too stuck into, in terms of a game plan. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't work, I might get too stuck. Yeah. So I watch maybe one or two matches more to see my opponent's habits, uh, styles, or like how they, what's their first step like? Yeah. Um, are they more offensive person or defensive? Just those kind of like little details. And so I can have a rough idea when I go into the match the next day. Without being stuck in yeah. the fixed game. Yeah. And if I don't know, if I don't watch a little bit, then it's almost like I'm kind of clueless. I understand some people like that way, so they can just adapt more naturally, but why not have a little bit of advantage, right? 
if you can score two, three touches because you had prior knowledge, because this fencer likes to cut here, you know, two, three points is a lot, you know, in those kind of matches, so. And, and how well do you work with your coaches at the moment in terms of um, communication? And some fencers like to be fairly limited in how they interact with their coaches in competition. Some like to talk a lot more. How are you in respect to that? Oh, during the match? During, during the match or competition as a whole? Yeah, I mean, for me, um, you know, I've told my coaches the best... The preferred way for me to be coached is, um, like, don't necessarily tell me what I'm doing wrong or, like, you're doing your bad habits. Well, I'm not going to be able to fix it in a competition. If I'm fencing a certain fencer, tell me what I need to do to beat this person, particularly at the moment. He likes to do this, you should do this. Okay, you got to stop doing this when he's doing that. Just focus on that particular moment. Don't focus on what I'm doing wrong necessarily or my bad habits. That's, that's going to come out, you know, a high yeah. stressful situation like a competition. Um, help me, because maybe I am thinking certain things, but if I hear that we're thinking the same, my body might react yeah. better and be like, okay, we really need to do this, thing, this action at a certain situation. So the best way I prefer to be coaches, help me beat this certain person by focusing on what I need to do on this match, you know. Oh, this fencer's like, he, he always cuts underneath. Let me know that. Then I'm going to be focused on more, you know, taking parry down on the two, you know, or something like that. So it's more, it's more specific. Yeah. Yeah. And, and how much of the um, psychological and like match management in terms of breathing and not blowing your head off, you know, getting angry, how... How important is that for you? I think it's very important. I think with any sport too, especially fencing, you got to focus one touch at a time. You know, pools are five points, D's are 15. And even those 15s, they go by quick. And so you really got to focus one touch at a time because even if you're down 10-0, you've seen big comebacks, right? Um, it can happen instantly. And one touch, two touch, three touches, and you're already back in the, you know, the match um, and also you know fen um, you know sabers highly rely relied on referee so you got to manage the referee as well you know you don't want to lose your cool to the referee as well you know you got to stay focused also communicate with the referee and adjust to the referee as well that's very important you know and so we're talking about referees there. How, because um, referees, they all have slightly different ways of seeing things. Mm -hmm. Do you have, um, as fencers, do you make an effort to know how different referees referee? So when you get a match, do you have an idea, okay, I should do these kind of actions, these kind of things? Yeah. Um, and more so, how, how do you, how should you communicate to this referee? Mm -hmm. I think that's more important. Okay. Um, and what kind of level of fencer you are. You know, if you're the top, you can maybe talk more aggressively. You know, it's up, you know, it's different. And certain referees really don't like you even questioning anything. So during with those referees, you just be quiet. You know, you acknowledge or you just kind of move on. Some referees you can argue more aggressively. Some you can question a little bit. You know, it's different. You just kind of know which referee is which. Um, and some of them do have preferences. Some referees like to call more actions with the legs. Some like faster hands. Um, and some referees are different that one competition. In the past, they might have called more legs. This competition is calling more hands. So you got to be able to adjust on the spot. And if, if you're, as you said, if you're a, you know, one of the higher ranked fences, you can perhaps get away with talking a bit more and... But if you're one of the lesser known fencers, how do you break through the ranks? Is it just purely by fencing well? I think, well, one, the best, easiest way is making results, right? Yeah. Um, but that might take a while and it's very difficult. But I think communicating to referees outside the competition, saying hello. Um, I'm not saying become best friends with them, but showing respect. Mm -hmm. You know, 
having conversation with them because they are human beings as too. You know, they they are working hard. They're where, you know, they're taking their time and you know coming to this competition because w without referees we wouldn't have a competition as well. So, you know, talking to them, saying hello, making sure they know who you are, then maybe, you know, you might get a chance. You know, they might not screw you too much. So that's the best advice I can give you. Just be friendly to them and just have communications with them. Yeah. I mean, I mean, my, you know, my main focus is, you know, going to the Olympics, doing well, individual and team, but, you know, having more eyeballs in the sport of fencing. I want more people to watch fencing because it's a beautiful sport. And yeah, I mean, even if you don't understand what's going on, I hope people can just watch because it's fun to watch, you know, and who doesn't like sword fighting, right? And so, and the more you watch, the more you understand and what you're doing is great. You know, you, you're not just showing matches, you're kind of making montages, fun videos as well. And hopefully more people watch your channel and enjoy fencing. Especially saber fencing, you know. That's the I think that's the best one, most entertaining. Um, might be the most confusing one, but it's definitely the most entertaining. So, yeah, I mean, whatever. I hope whatever platform I have, I can just promote the sport of fencing. You know. I think I need to look at like. Yeah, hope so. Yeah, that's about it for me. <laughs> that's perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah.